Uh, to motivate my paper, I want to start out by summarizing what we know. So first of all, low-skill labor mobility is controversial. In receiving countries, we know that uh, people are concerned about the labor market, the social, the physical consequences of higher low-skill labor mobility. Um, they're also concerned about um, temporary foreign workers overstaying. So there's a quote, um, there's nothing more permanent than temporary foreign workers. Uh, in sending countries, people are concerned about uh, the abuse of the workers abroad by their employers. Um, they're also concerned about governments trying to promote low-skill labor mobility at the cost of worker rights and conditions. Um, on the other hand, we also know that low-skill labor mobility can be beneficial. Um, in receiving country, it alleviates access demand of labor as their population age, and it helps re uh, governments retain firms that would instead move their production processes abroad. Um, this is not only beneficial for tax revenue purposes, and also helps politicians win elections. In sending countries, um, people are uh, low-skill labor mobility uh, helps, helps relieve access supply of low-skill labor, um, and it, uh, this is supportive of political and social stability, and also generates remittances that we all know um, are highly resilient in recessions, oftentimes exceed in foreign and portfolio investment in FDI in many developing countries. So as a result, um, bilateral labor agreements, usually taken the form of MOAs or MOUs, um, these are uh, really flexible bilateral arrangements that specify uh, cost assignments, et cetera. Um, the BLAs have been recently touted as an example of formal international cooperation that can lead to triple win, um, in which um, receiving countries, sending countries, and migrants can all reap the benefits, the economic benefits of higher cross-border labor mobility, while mitigating some of the political costs that um, in the previous slide. Um, so this begs the question, do BLAs actually facilitate cross-border labor mobility? Um, there's a large literature in political science uh, that makes international institutions and higher cross-border mobility of goods and capital. Um, in contrast, there's few studies that, in political science, or, or political economy at least, few studies offer systematic evidence linking international institutions and cross-border mobility of people. Um, among the recent empirical evidence, um, there is uh, a mix, uh, mix of evidence, um, ranging from positive, negative, to null, or really small and negligent effects. So one of the main problems that I um, identify in the paper is that this, uh, one of the reasons for this is that because the country level data employed in a lot of empirical studies actually um, confounds country level effects with migrant worker effects. Um, more specifically, different workers, they work in different destination countries. Um, for example, Filipino nurses um, oftentimes time come to the UK um, while um, their construction workers go to the UAE. Um, furthermore, there might be this heterogeneous BLA effect conditional on uh, individual characteristics such as skill level. So the goal of this paper is, uh, first of all, to contrast theoretically the effect of international agreements um, on people flows against uh, goods or capital flows. Um, more specifically, um, I argue that bilateral labor agreements actually introduce additional costs on the mover in labor mo um, migration in contrast to lowering barriers and costs for the mover in trade, which is goods, or investment, which is capital. Um, I then propose a theory that reconciles, uh, attempts to reconcile extant mixed findings. Um, I argue that skill level mediates the effect of BLAs, um, and more specifically, BLAs reduce the mobility for the low skill workers, but increase in mobility for the high skill workers. I then test empirically uh, the theoretical implications with a new uh, dyadic skill level um, overseas Filipino worker data set um, compiled by McKinsey et al. Um, and I, I would argue that this is more fine-grained and it's more precise and more relevant for the study of BLAs. Um, so to talk a little uh, more deeply about the theory, um, for, so the literature in political science talks about um, how um, international organizations and agreements could um, have a positive effect on cross-border flows of goods and capital. Um, and basically the argument is that these international institutions reduce state-level market failures um, that are related to three, what I call three Cs, communication problems, commitment problems, and coordination problems. Uh, first of all, um, international institutions can act as a transparency and signal device that reduces either unintentional language miscommunications or intentional asymmetric information across different countries. 
Um, and it, international institutions can also act as a commitment <coughs> device that in, induces audience or reputation costs for uh, country negging on their um, uh, agreements. Um, and finally, international institutions can also act as a coordination device that reduces vacancy or screening costs by explicitly assigning certain uh, responsibilities or costs to certain parties. Um, therefore, if we, if by like, following this logic, if we ex expect that uh, uh, BLAs, if BLA parallel PTAs, which are preferential trade agreements and bilateral investment agreements and their effects, then we, we should expect BLAs to in, in, uh, promote labor mobility. However, um, taking a perspective from a migration uh, cost perspective, uh, instead of simply reducing those, those costs uh, of market failures, um, bilateral agreements, I would argue, are unique in which they shift the cost to the sending state governments, to receiving country firms, and employers, and ultimately the costs are passed on to migrant workers themselves. And these costs, for example, are transportation, transportation insurance, health, legal, uh, et cetera. Uh, so the implication for labor mobility, I argue, is that uh, the effect of BLA on labor mobility is conditional on, actually mediated by a uh, skill level. Um, more specifically, low-skill migrants are more vulnerable to BLA-induced costs because they're usually either in more uh, higher debt um, and because they borrowed to go abroad to work or they have a uh, little market or bargaining power against uh, being uh, passed on these costs. Uh, furthermore, BLAs can um, reduce receiving country firm demand um, for foreign skilled, uh, low skilled labor because of things like minimum wage requirements. In contrast, high skilled labor are less vulnerable um, to BLA in these costs because uh, the demand is higher, um, fees are usually waived from them, they have more savings, they have more access to financing, um, and also they're oftentimes regulated under um, gas mode 4. Um, and, and finally, high school labor, uh, labor they could benef actually benefit from the BLA induced positive externalities, uh, such as human rights, working conditions, and minimum wage. Um, so this is basically a summary of um, three different implications um, and so to test the, uh, the hypotheses, um, I employed the data set compiled by McKenzie um, et al. Um, they had the individual level data. Um, they didn't negotiate it with the Filipino uh, government and then they got the individual data, but they signed a contract so they couldn't uh, release that individual. So um, I could get the aggregated data up to the skill level. So, so it's a skill destination country year um, data set. Um, the universe of analysis is overseas, all overseas Filipino workers um, to 173 destination countries from 1992 to 2009. Um, the outcome of interest is, uh, what I try to test is overseas Filipino mobility, which I operationalize in two ways. The first way, uh, may, uh, which I talked about here, is basically a rate. So all so new hires for given skill level, destination, and year, uh, as the percentage of all possible, uh, all total uh, new hires in the same skill level in here. So it's a, it's a rate measure. Um, I also tried a simple basic account measure, um, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, at the very end. Um, my key covariates are uh, bilateral labor agreements and uh, skill level. Both are dichotomous variables and I interact them. Um, I also control for various individual level, destination, country level, dyad level, time varying characteristics. Um, so here I plot basically um, a snapshot. In 2009, um, the upper panel is uh, for low skill mobility, the bottom is for high skill. Um, you can see that. Um, so labor mobility doesn't really change across here temporally. Um, most of the variation is cross sectional. Um, and you can also see that there are similarities between um, low skill and high skill. Um, so here's a list of 20 uh, bilateral labor agreements signed by the Philippine government. Um, and also the year they were first signed. So, um, so here, uh, basically, I, I fit a Bayesian generalized linear mixed model. Um, uh, in some fields, it's called um, a multi-level model, uh, basically, but I implemented in the uh, Bayesian version um, with varying intercepts for destination countries and years. And I also played with a lot of other different specifications, but we could talk more if you're interested. Um, and here, I plot um, some of the, the, the coefficients. Um, and so if we focus on, um, so the first, the first three, so BLA, um, when skill level is uh, zero for low skill, um, the coefficient is basically negative. 
um, the interaction is positive. Um, of course, um, to give you a better sense of um, the magnitude of effects, um, um, I, for, I simulate for a typical country um, not having a bilateral labor agreement with Philippine government and having a bilateral labor agreement with the Philippines and the magnitude, what changes in their labor mobility. So if you could, if you look at the solid lines here, um, so basically there, this is around 40,000 uh, uh, estimates of the effect of uh, bilateral labor agreements on low skills. The mean is around, uh, so the mean is around point, negative 0.5. So in other words, um, having a bilateral labor agreement uh, is associated with, on average, 0.5% lower labor mobility. In contrast, if you look at high skill, um, it's associated with about like 1.25% higher labor mobility. Um, and since um, basically the all of the estimates are above zero, so I'm 100% um, sure that these estimates are positive. And around 98% of these are negative, so about 98% probability that they are negative. Of course, this is um, the confidence of this uh, is, uh, assumes parametric assumptions and a lot of other um, stuff when you, when you do multi level models. Um, so, to conclude, um, the premise that international institutions promote cross border economic integration by mitigating problems with market failures is central to the political economy literature. Um, my findings using overseas Filipino data suggest a more complicated picture. The effect of bilateral labor agreements are mediated by the skill level of migrant workers. And this is because of the unique nature of BLAs. They solve state level market failures from what by shifting costs to the migrant worker instead. Um, and this reconciles some of the emerging negligible or mixed findings. Um, the broader implications of this study is that um, it introduces an additional layer, lay, uh, layer of actor preferences absent, at least in the political science literature, um, looking where they usually look at either states or firms. Um, migrants have preferences while goods and capital don't have preferences, and this complicates the interaction between states and firms. Um, it also um, illuminates the importance of examining whether migration policy agreements actually match their in intentions. Um, a lot of political economy uh, explanations about uh, migration outcome, policy outcomes rely on the fundamental assumption about how policy affect um, flows and then how that affects um, individual active preferences. Um, however, little empirical work, at least in the political science work, or literature, has been done to verify whether those assumptions um, hold out of, outside of experimental settings, which I think um, a lot of the papers in this conference actually could help. And um, finally, the heterogeneous treatment effect of BLAs show the benefits of incorporating as fine-grained data as possible, especially um, in a lot of research where individual characteristics can confound state or dyad-level characteristics that the study is interested in. And so, um, to kind of uh, show some of the complications of the, so this is still work in progress. Um, one minute, so um, I did a couple of like basic OLS um, with fixed effects, a multi-level approach with frequentist approach, and then operationalizing my dependent variable as uh, just simply count. So a Poisson, Poisson model, Poisson with fixed effects, and then, so these, um, since the data with Cal data, there's um, oftentimes over dispersion where you need negative binomial models. And then there's a lot of zeros, um, basically no uh, hires in diet in certain years. So these, these two models try to address those effect, uh, those problems, but um, the result, results are less significant, which I'm still figuring out why. Um, and I'll also try to, um, so these are kind of, use the, uh, this, it's a, called a synthetic control method where you kind of try to construct a counterfactual of what would have happened if bilateral labor agreements didn't um, exist in some, some of the countries. And you can see that these are some of the supporting cases. Um, and then um, these are ambiguous, uh, actually. So if you look at Taiwan, bilateral labor agreements lower low skill mobility, but high school, it's not clear. So it's more ambiguous. And then there are contradicting cases, the UK, where um, it's actually the opposite. So these are still uh, extensions I'm still trying to figure out um, and um, examining. Um, and, but thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your comments and questions.